thanks very much, Eric. It's great to be here this afternoon. Can I just uh, join, I'm sure, uh, many acknowledgements of Stephen Selwood and the great work he has done at Infrastructure New Zealand, and also acknowledge uh, you, Paul, as you step into that role and the challenges that you've got. Many of you will know uh, I've been a frequent caller at these conferences. I've enjoyed coming here for many uh, years. Nadine, I remember coming in, I think, with a Tesla with you one year, and so it's great to be back. I love infrastructure. I've been hugely passionate about the portfolios I've been privileged to have, whether transport, energy, communications, uh, economic development, and others that have had an infrastructural uh, focus. I well uh, remember just this week, actually, I was in Radio Hauraki. It's not known for its uh, cerebral focus on these things, but somehow we got onto transport, and they asked me what percentage of my brain was taken up with transport. I answered 27%. So for a simple guy like me, uh, that's a fairly large quantity of time I spend thinking uh, about these things. Of course, it's not just me. It's the National Party, and we believe that we are the party of infrastructure. We aspire to be a more than that, in fact, to be a government of infrastructure that gets New Zealand building and moving. I I'm not going to talk too long. And I've got my colleague Paul here, Paul Goldsmith, and I think hopefully we have a little time in this graveyard shift for a, a small number of questions. But can I simply say this in summary? My view is this. The new government's come in. It has stopped all of our projects. It hasn't started uh, any, and it's slowing New Zealand down. And our job, if we have the privilege to be the government after the next election, as I say, is to get building and to get things moving again. I talked about cancelled projects, and many of you in this room have lived this. You know this because it is literally what you do day in and day out. We went to the last election promising $10.5 billion of a next generation of roads of national significance uh, over a decade. A and of course there is, if Grant Robertson or indeed perhaps Shane Jones were here, a difference between political promise and between projects that are fully funded, that are consented, designated, designed, planned, uh, and through procurement. But even if we simply take those projects that were ready for construction uh, this term, we are talking about a power of work, many billions of dollars of projects that have been stopped from Whangarei to Northport, that was due to start at the start of this year in terms of construction. The East-West Link, that was ready for start. The Tauranga Northern Link, one dear to my heart, that was literally pulled halfway through commercial tender in Otaki to live in, being, as I say, just there, I think, some $4 billion worth of work that, in my view, should be happening in New Zealand uh, at the moment. It's absolutely legitimate, and I may not like it, perhaps some of you don't like it, for a new government to come in and to have a change of priorities and directions. But cancelling our projects was small, spiteful, and a stupid thing to do. And indeed, in my view, it was the cardinal sin of this government. Because with the stopping of projects, and the non-start of the things that perhaps they want to get on with. They broke that construction pipeline and there is nothing to go on to. Projects, of course, take a huge amount of time from the inception, the idea, the formation, through the work that required to be done uh, to construction. And, and it seems to me it's like turning around a large steamer it's not simply the stopping of the project till it starts again. It's the massive wasted opportunity cost, uh, the, the, more than just the actual time delay that is the problem here. It was because of politics. It was because uh, some in the government don't like roads. And it's also, I think, because there has been a change of priorities to a new light rail, a tram project down 
to Menion Road. But therein lies the issue. Nothing new has been started. And literally nothing we didn't start has started in this term. The first pr promise of our Prime Minister uh, was to start construction before the next election of a large slow tram down Dominion Road. But to date we have no business case. We are many years off and I personally, uh, and Eric asked me to give a view on it and I will, I'm deeply skeptical of the project at least in its current iteration. Because it seems to me if we listen to the millennials on the stage talking about autonomous vehicles and the things that are coming at us, it is old technology, it is a slow technology. On this stage, look, uh, a fortnight ago I made a, a pledge. I said if that tram was in construction before the next election, I'd run down Dominion Road in my undies. Um, you'll be pleased to know I don't think I'm going to have to keep uh, that pledge uh, a around this project. A and meanwhile, it seems to me, what the construction sector is making do with is maintenance, is some safety projects, some rumble strips. I just don't see that that cuts it. What will we do? Well, we'll be a government of infrastructure. Before the next election, we will release an infrastructure plan that, in my view, clearly needs to be ambitious, I hope more ambitious than where we've been uh, before. And part of it, because I agree not with everything uh, the Reserve Bank Governor is doing, Oliver, you'll be pleased uh, to know, uh, but I agree with him that infrastructure should be a priority. Our economic plan will involve tax relief, cutting of red tape, and being serious about infrastructure. Last election, as I said, we had our roads of national significance. We had a rail package, at none of which, whether it's the third main, whether it's Papakura uh, to uh, Pukekohe electrification is happening at this time, but I would like to do more. It seems to me a focus on the Golden Triangle is hugely important. It seems to me, and I acknowledge you had Shane Jones, Matua Shane here, but a $3 billion fund into Northland isn't going to make the difference. The beads and blankets, frankly, aren't going to change the dial, but a four-lane highway will bring connectivity and proximity to our capital of commerce and really make the difference that is required there. I'd like to do much more than that besides. If we're ambitious around transport and infrastructure more broadly, the obvious question is, well, that's good, but how do we pay for it? There's a, a trendy argument, it seems to me, that's, as I say, trendy amongst the Shamabil Jacobs, the Ganesh Nanas, a number of econom economists, dare I say, she may be in the room, have a lot of respect for her, the Fran O'Sullivans uh, of this world, that actually we should be borrowing. We should be borrowing a lot more and getting into these things. I accept, and my colleague Paul Goldsmith accepts, that there's good borrowing and bad borrowing. Actually, we are doing infrastructure, that makes some sense. But I don't necessarily accept that actually we do need to borrow significantly to do this sort of work. The reality is in New Zealand, we've got very low public debt. This government's increasing it by some $17 billion. I worry what they will do if there is an economic shock. And the reality is as well, we have very high private debt. I don't think for myself, we necessarily need to borrow significantly to be ambitious, truly ambitious, when it comes to transport. It seems to me the National Land Transport Fund accumulates some $4 billion in taxes, and that's a political hot potato at the moment, every single year. And it's not being spent. I made the case for you, but I have no doubt 
whether it's AT or it's NZTA, the reality is as those RONs come off, as we don't have a next generation of large projects ready to go, there is money sitting there that can be uh, invested uh, in new projects. I, I also say it's about priorities. My priorities, were I to have the privilege of being Prime Minister, would literally be threefold in investment. Health, education, and infrastructure. And I wouldn't be investing significantly in other areas. Whether it's fees free, whether it's the Shane Jones Fund, whether it's working groups, whether it's Kiwi Build, it seems to me actually, if you're disciplined about investment, you can do a lot of things that works well. And I also say this to you, and can I acknowledge, we were too timid in this when we were in government. I started to think more about it at the end of our term, but the reality of it is that was too late. I believe when it comes to infrastructure, we should do whatever works in terms of funding and financing. PPPs are good. I started the two, uh, or certainly involved in the two, uh, in transport, whether Puhoi to Walkworth, uh, whether uh, Transmission Gully. And they bought innovation, some cost savings from the way they have been done. And so, yep, they're good. But what they don't bring is magic money. They don't allow you actually to do more. They're a financing mechanism that, as I say, brings some innovation in the project, but they are no silver bullet. T tolling only goes so far. My recollection from the NZTA officials and other transport officials when I was Minister of Transport is, yep, tolling has some benefit, believe you me. I'm Member of Parliament for Electorate that has two of the three tolling booths uh, in New Zealand. But really it's only a very limited number of transport corridors in New Zealand that have the traffic volume to make those tolling uh, uh, technologies work well and provide the financial return required to make it all sort of work. It, it seems to me there's a difference between financing and funding, and we should be truly bold when it comes to these things, whatever works. I personally don't think we need to own the infrastructure. It seems to me I can remember as Transport Minister, Jeff Dangerfield, the then Chief Executive of NZTA coming to me he was excited about, I think it was designation uh, of the corridor for uh, a tunnel, uh, a, a, a harbour crossing uh, in Auckland. The expected cost of that crossing, somewhere between four and seven billion dollars. The time frame, look, sometime in the next 40 years. W well, I sort of think, why does it matter who owns it? If private entities could come in and fund that and do it, and frankly own it for 70 years and make a return, but it meant we had the benefit of that infrastructure, we should be doing whatever works uh, in this area. O I've obviously focused very heavily on transport, because it seems to me it has a real power, as I say, to get New Zealand building and to get our country moving. O I acknowledge what Eric said. We. This government needs to do more in housing. I am absolutely up for bold RMA reform, and my colleague Judith Collins is working hard on that. I, I think that will be important for housing, for that sort of construction. But I actually think we should be thinking about other things as well. Peter Reedy uh, is here. Uh, some, of, uh, uh, s some others here who are involved with me in the Kaikoura corridor post-earthquakes. Well. Because of that earthquake, we moved heaven and earth. We had special legislation in Parliament, uh, and as a result of that, we got on and did that road in a kind of record timing. You could never do it under conventional settings. It seems to me if we all accept we have an infrastructure deficit and we want to be serious about infrastructure, we should be doing those sorts of things, not just because there's an earthquake, but because we do want to get New Zealand building and moving. We've been clear we believe in water, 
We need an infrastructure fund. I personally don't believe that simply leaving it to the free market is going to be good enough, whether it's for the issues in urban areas uh, or in rural New Zealand, and we'll be more clear about that uh, in due course. But can I say once again, it's great to be here, that I aspire to make sure New Zealand doesn't just stop stuff, it gets on and builds it and gets this country moving. Thanks very much. I think I'm inviting Paul up to the stage for the remaining nine minutes, 44. Why don't we have a quick seat and do that this, that way? There's plenty of questions coming in for you. There's a microphone there for you as well, Paul. Um, you've answered so many of my questions already because you know what was on my notes, Simon? Um, undies, underlined. <laughs> so you, you've answered that one. You think you're safe and well, we're I safe. Well, I was technically quite clear because I said I would run down Dominion Road with my undies. So think that through. That didn't necessarily mean I wasn't clothed. Oh, someone missed the scoop on that one. That was very clever. Um, before we perhaps get to some of the questions, um, I wanted to just put to you one of the concepts that we've delved into quite heavily today, and that is the concept of localism, because obviously this is building nations, but this year we've focused on building the regions, and you've already told us that you're quite sceptical of the Provincial Growth Fund and the way that that's being administered. So I want to know what you think, I know you've spoken to Oliver Hartwich from the New Zealand Initiative, um, whether you, in opposition, would be willing to come up with some kind of policy that would devolve some power and some revenue back to the regions that need to improve their infrastructure. Let me, let me just say a few things, and Paul jump in as well, about uh, local government. I, I think local, local government's got some real problems in New Zealand. It's not local government's fault, fundamentally. Um, I think if I look at our time in office, we never put a senior enough minister in that portfolio for long enough to really give it, um, if you pardon my expression, the beans that it requires. I, I'm fundamentally conflicted when it comes to what we should do, and I'm happy to be candid about that. Uh, I, I take the view that actually there is something in what Oliver and others talk about in relate, regard to localism. I accept that we want to incentivise local authorities, so authorities to be competitive, to be business-like, to do the right thing. There is a compelling logic to giving back GST at some level, whether it's for uh, uh, housing developments or, or tourism uh, or the like. But I've got to tell you what is also true uh, is as we have surveyed New Zealanders um, as we go through a very strong policy process at the moment, uh, I thought IRD might come out as the least favoured government entity. It's local government. There's an issue there in that people don't trust them to get on with their job, uh, uh, with the job. And so I worry about handing power over uh, uh, to a system at the moment that I think needs significant help and re re rebuilding is before we do that. Is that a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario, that people are probably dissatisfied with local government because they look around at their local infrastructure and they feel dissatisfied, but the local government doesn't have the resources to deliver it? I think that's right. Oh, you, you mentioned also the Provincial Growth Fund, and, and I think we just need to make clear, uh, you know, the National Party has always been uh, the party for regional New Zealand, uh, and about a quarter of the billion dollar a year fund is money that uh, the previous government was investing around um, regional development and the tourism infrastructure fund, and we're supportive of that, and we're supportive of good spending in the regions. Uh, what we were concerned about is the very loose and um, nakedly political way in which uh, the, the particular minister has gone about it, uh, and uh, to the victor goes the spoils is his tagline. And uh, so we are asking perfectly legitimate questions about the quality of the spending and wanting to ensure that we're getting good results. And it worries us, frankly, that the only uh, effort made to assess the effectiveness of the spending for $3 billion is that uh, at the end, once they've spent the money, they're going to get Treasury to do a quick sum summary to work out whether it was good value or not. And that doesn't seem to me to be a good way to spend $3 billion. Simon, you seem to be saying there that should you be in a position to be the Prime Minister after the next election, that you're going to be putting forward something bold for infrastructure, which is what the Business Advisory Council has said is required, right? There's a serious deficit, we need more than business as usual, we need transformation. But you've also said that you don't want 
to borrow more, that PPPs don't necessarily allow you to do any more, and that you're not a fan of the petrol excise taxes and the likes of Auckland. So where is the money going to come from for a transformational program? Well, I'm making the clear case to you, and I think the facts stack up, that in terms of the land transport fund, you've got $4 billion coming in there. Actually, it's not being spent at the moment. It's an awful lot of rumble strip strips to make up for an east-west link, right? And east-west link was meant to be being built right now. Tauranga Northern Link and others were. Do you got that money there? Fundamentally, as the ROMs come off, and they all come off by 2020, you, you've got a gap in that pot of money that needs to be invested, right? I also think what's true, take the Shane Jones Fund, and we won't go through why we dislike that, but fundamentally, that's $3 billion. You've got $2 billion for Kiwi Build. You've got half a billion dollars going on working groups. You've got $2.8 billion going on students and fees free. There is money there, and it is a question of priorities. Ultimately, if we needed to borrow to do the business of infrastructure and make sure we were doing the sort of things I've talked to you about, you know, that may be something we would have to do. But I, I do say, actually, the trendy argument that it's by definition got to happen doesn't seem to ring to, true to me when actually we got a lot of money coming in through the petrol taxes uh, and there is a lot of wastage with the current government. Let's take some of the questions coming through from Slido. We've kind of answered the first one about your views on sharing GST and, and local authorities. Um, so the next one here is how do you reconcile your roads of national significance with the need to reduce the nation's carbon footprint? Well, how controversial do you want me to be? Um, as controversial as you like. Uh, Go out with a bang today. You, you know, uh, I was talking, I won't, I won't use his name, but a very senior former, sadly, NZTA official here this afternoon, uh, he made the point, and I agree with him, it's a complete cartoon caricature to say we didn't do public transport. I started the CRL. Uh, all of the various public transport projects in Auckland, the government is trumpeting, right now started under us. We invested comparable money in Kiwi Rail to what we invested in our blessed roads of national significance. So I don't see it as an either or. But, you know, where I disagree perhaps with the millennials on the stage was that regional New Zealand, dare I say it, Tauranga, 120,000 people, ain't getting light rail anytime soon. It's just not going to stack up in a city of our size. Uh, the idea of fast rail uh, that Fran and others have trumpeted from Tauranga to Auckland is fanciful. The numbers will never work. They barely work, dare I say it, in the UK with an HS2 with a population of some 10 million in that sort of area. And so we do need decent roading infrastructure that's safer, that deals with congestion, and that provides the capacity to get our goods around, and actually mums to sport, uh, parents to, 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 to the classroom, uh, and, and goods to, to supermarkets. Obviously at the moment the concern is that the economy is slowing. Is there anything that was shelved by the current government in terms of infrastructure projects that you would pull off and do right now as a measure to stimulate the economy? If, um, you know, there was an implosion in the coalition, who, who would think that could happen? Um, and something went badly wrong and we were suddenly in government, I, I would start tomorrow, uh, east-west, Whangarei to Northport, uh, the Tauranga Northern Link, uh, and Otaki to live in. Uh, I, I've got no doubt about the worth of those projects. They, they were projects that weren't like the Shane Jones Fund, frankly. The NZTA board, the NZTA process decided they stacked up. The benefit-cost ratios were all there. We should get on and do them. The point I'm making, though, is we should be bolder than that, a and I have a, a deep aspiration to do that. Uh, the other point on the economy, of course, is we, we shouldn't forget the fact that you know New Zealand should be doing well right now. We've got you know, export prices are as high at historic high levels. Uh, the world wants our goods. Uh, New Zealand has a lot to offer. 
and what we've actually been held back by is a collapse in business confidence and investment, and that can be sheeted home to uh, uh, the government introducing so much uncertainty with all these working groups and talk of capital gains taxes uh, uh, and adding a huge amount of costs on No more talk of capital gains taxes and, now. Uh, that's right, and also demonstrating sort of incompetence around its management. Okay, we've got 23 seconds left, so I'm just going to throw you a small topic. Um, would you support bipartisan approach to RMA reform? Yeah, um, y yes, we would. Uh, the, the reality of that is uh, uh, Judith Collins has written to the minister. I, I think ultimately he's kicked it for touch uh, for the moment. I, I think the reality is, though, where a government puts climate change uh, at the heart of their RMA reform, it, it's difficult, it seems to me, for that to be serious RMA reform that allows you to get on what I, I was talking about, whether it's the roads of national significance, whether it's building housing. And we're unapologetic. I believe in climate change. I'm a former climate minister. But I also believe if we want to do what's my first priority, and that's get New Zealand building and moving, there will be quite fundamental differences between us and certainly the Labor uh, and the Green Party. Would you nix the provincial growth fund if you came into power, or would you just do it differently? We would invest in the provinces, uh, absolutely. Uh, we wouldn't be necessarily calling it a provincial growth fund, and it wouldn't necessarily be a billion dollars a year. Just on bipartisanship, can I just sort of mention, obviously, the big news of the day is the appointment to the uh, Infrastructure Commission people, and you know, we as a party are supportive of that. And we see it, it's incredibly important that we have a, a broad, uh, agreed pipeline of work in order to get efficiency into the system. So you know, we're all on, on deck for that. The only point we would make is that we just would hope that the minister would be consistent in his thinking about that because on the one hand, he's talking about an infrastructure commission and bipartisanship. On the other hand, he's got a, a, his mate up in Northland uh, looking at the ports in a rinky-dink kind of way on the side. And you've got to have one or the other. You can't sort of uh, deal with major infrastructure investments over time uh, in both those ways and be consistent. I would love to talk to you longer, but I am aware that we are what is standing between these people and a drink. Uh, so I will say thank you very much. Uh, Simon, no Tesla this year, but I did arrive on a Lime scooter, so if you would like a dub to drinks, um, the offer is there. Please put your hands together for Simon Bridges hey, and Paul so Goldsmith.